Today we're going to introduce complex and imaginary numbers. So let's just start with some simple definitions. Now the imaginary unit number i uh, is what you may have seen before. We're going to use the symbol j because we're going to do a lot of circuit analysis and in circuits i is often used for current. So to avoid confusion we're going to use with j. And the definition of j is that j squared is equal to minus 1. Or you could say that j is equal to the square root of minus 1. This might seem a little weird at first if you uh, haven't seen this before because you may have thought before um, that the square root of negative numbers have sort of a maybe ill-defined or there's something strange about it. But we'll see it's nothing strange at all and that's actually quite uh, useful. So let's just see a little bit how this comes about naturally. When you were uh, little you learned probably about the integers and you may not have called it that but you probably did things like counted. And as you learned to count and when you were little you probably also learned about addition. 4 plus 4 is equal to 8. And as you got a little bit older you learned about multiplication. So instead of adding a bunch of things like 4 plus 4 plus 4 we could just simply write it as 4 times 3. And as you got even older still you learned about powers. So you might have learned that 4 to the third is a way to represent 4 times 4 times 4. Now, once you learn about these, you also learn about the inverse operations. And you probably started doing, off doing things like 5 minus 4, but at some point you do something like 4 minus 5, and you get something like negative 1. And this leads to the concept of negative numbers, which you are actually quite familiar with uh, but at the time that they were sort of invented or came about, they're actually quite uh, controversial. Other, other, another uh, inverse operation is the square root. And so you might have done seen something like x squared equals to 2 and solve for x. So that gives you that x is equal to the square root of 2, which is an irrational number. So again, a kind of strange concept at the time uh, it appeared, uh, but it's a number that can't be represented as a fraction. Uh, and so in this vein, the complex number, or the imaginary number, comes about because we get equ equations that look like x squared is equal to minus 1. And so that led us to the imaginary number to define the square root of minus 1. And now, the fact that we call the square root of minus 1 an imaginary number, again, makes it sound like it's made up. But it's no more made up than things you're familiar with, like irrational numbers, negative numbers, or even 0. So an imaginary number is one where we have like some factor like say 5 times j. So again, j squared is equal to minus 1, or j is the square root of minus 1. So this is what we call an imaginary number. So it's some number that you're used to times this weird number j. Complex number is one that has both a real and an imaginary part. So something like 4 plus 5 times j. So our generic complex number, z, we could write as x plus jy, something like that. So we have a real part and what we call the imaginary part. And a common way to represent this is just as a simple plot, where on the x-axis we put the real number, and on the y-axis we put the imaginary number. So we have our number x, there's our point y, and so we just simply go over, and there's our complex number right there, x plus j times y. So we just put it as a simple xy plot, and we could also define this complex number as r, the distance to the origin, so like the radius, right? So the distance from the origin out to the complex number, and uh, theta, the angle that this uh, vector here makes with the real axis. And geometry just relates these things, so things that you've seen before. So Pythagorean's theorem tells us that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. And if we want to know what theta is, we just have to remember our trigonometric identities. So the, the tangent of theta would be this over that. So theta is the arc tangent of y over x. Now another important relationship is that if z is equal to x plus j times y, we see that x is equal to r cosine of theta plus j times r sine of theta. This is a relationship that will be quite useful. Now I'm going to prove to you one of the most useful identities. If you've seen this before, you can skip through this, but if you haven't, it's probably worth uh, going through just so you'll actually believe it. And my proof here is going to rely on something that hopefully you remember called the Taylor series. And the Taylor series just says, okay, let's imagine we have some arbitrary function f of x. And it says, okay, let's imagine that we know everything about the function at x equals to zero. Let's build up an approximation of that function. So the first thing we could do is we could say, okay, well, the simplest approximation at x equals to zero is just the value of the function at x equals to zero. So just f evaluated at zero. The next thing we could do is we could go in 
and we could match the slope, and at least for a little bit, very close to x equals to zero, this would do quite well. So we could add in the derivative of f with respect to x, evaluate at x equals zero times x. So we just fit a line to the function. And the next thing we could do is we could kind of match the curvature. So we now have a little parabola that locally fits the function. And the way we would match that is we would take the second derivative of f with respect to x, evaluate it at x equals to zero, and multiplied by x squared over two. And we could keep going with this, and the pattern that we would find is that we just keep adding the nth derivative of f, evaluated at x equals zero, multiplied by x to the n, divided by n factorial. And so this approximation would sort of at, would, would start by matching the value, the slope, the curvature, and so on and so forth. Hopefully you've seen this before, but let's uh, just work through this again. So let's apply this to our test function, f of x is e to the x. Now this is a really nice function because df dx in this case, when I take the derivative of e to the x, what do I get? And when I take the second derivative of f with respect to x, I get e to the x. So it makes filling in this thing uh, quite easy. So let's just work through it and see what we get. So our approximation for e to the x around x equals to zero is gonna be the value of the function evaluated at zero, so e to the zero, plus the derivative of the function evaluated at x equals to zero, e to the zero times x, plus the second derivative evaluated at zero. Again, we just get back e to the x. We take the second derivative times x squared over two, plus, and so on and so forth. And e to the zero is just one, e to the zero is just one, e to the zero is just one. And so the pattern that you get is one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over three factorial plus x fourth over four factorial plus on and on and on x to the n over n factorial. So pretty cool. So this is our approximation for e to the x. And it gets better and better and better as we add more and more terms and it's really only accurate around x equals to zero. As we get further and further away, it gets less and less accurate unless we essentially include an infinite number of terms. So let's do a couple other functions. Let's do cosine of x. So in this case, df dx is minus sine of x. The second derivative is minus cosine of x. The third derivative is sine of x, and so on and so forth. So we could kind of keep going with that. So let's uh, work this out. So cosine of x is gonna be approximately our value of the function evaluated at zero, so cosine of zero, plus the first derivative evaluated at zero, so we pick up a minus sign, so minus sine of zero times x. So I almost wrote cosine of theta, so cosine of zero, the second derivative, times x squared over two, plus the third derivative, sine of zero, times x cubed over three factorial. Plus, and if we go up to the fourth term, we're back to cosine of zero, times x to the fourth, over four factorial. So you might notice that sine of zero is zero. So all those terms will go away and you would notice a pattern if you kept carrying this out that all the odd terms would be zero and all my cosine of zeros will turn to one. And so you can kind of see the pattern here. We have one minus x squared over two plus x to the fourth over four factorial and the continued pattern would be x to the sixth over six factorial plus x to the eighth over eight factorial. Pretty cool, right? Now let's try this out for sine of x. So f of x is equal to sine of x. Uh, again, we can just do the derivative. So df dx is gonna be the cosine of x. The second derivative is minus sine of x. Third derivative is equal to minus cosine of x and kind of so on and so forth. And you kind of see the similarity between the sine and the cosine. So let's just carry everything out. So sine of x is gonna equal to sine of zero. So the value of the function evaluated at zero plus the derivative of the function evaluated at zero. So cosine of zero times x minus the third, adding in the second derivative. So we pick up a minus sign. So minus sine of zero, x squared over two. And so you kind of see the pattern again. And again, all my terms with sine are gonna go away. So in this case, all the even terms and all these cosine of zeros are gonna turn into one. And so the pattern now, now we see the similarity. So the cosine, we only have the even terms. 
the sine, we have the odd terms because cosine and sine are even and odd functions respectively. We have this kind of power series where we're going 1, x squared, x fourth, x six. Here we have x, x cubed, x five, x sevenths. And then we have the alternating signs because when I take the derivatives of sine and cosine, they alternate. Okay, so now we're finally in a position to set my value of my function, f of x equal to e to the jx, where again, j squared is going to equal to minus 1. So now we have to be a little bit careful uh, with our signs. So df dx, first derivative is going to be j e to the jx. The second derivative is going to be j squared, so minus e to the jx. Third derivative is going to be minus j e to the jx. And obviously, we can now do the fourth derivative. We're back to e to the jx. And so those are our derivatives. And just while we're at it, we'll just write out what the derivatives are evaluated at 0. So now uh, we can do our Taylor series. We're sort of on and on and on. So let's just substitute in the terms. Evaluated at 0, we have 1. df dx evaluated here, we pick up the factor j x. Second derivative, pick up a minus 1. And so when we simply substitute everything in, we find that all our parts that have only uh, real numbers, so 1s and minus 1s, uh, exactly corresponds to the cosine of x series that we derived just a second ago. And all the terms that have the imaginary number j have the kind of odd series here, which is equal to sine of x. So we've proved using the Taylor series the function that we wanted. e to the jx is equal to cosine of x plus j sine of x. Now that was an awful lot of trouble, so now I'm going to have to justify in sort of the next several videos uh, why this is useful to know. So let's go back to our generic complex number. Just recall our plot. We have the real axis and the imaginary axis. Here's x, here's y, and we could equivalently write that as r and theta. And as you recall from geometry, x is the same thing as r cosine theta, and y is the same thing as r sine of theta. But we can use the identity we just derived and rewrite this as r e to the j theta. And so this is a notation that we use quite co commonly here where we take our complex number, which is real plus imaginary part, and we write it in this other form, r e to the j theta. And as we move along, it'll become apparent why we do that. But let me just show you a few quick examples, one being complex multiplication. So let's take two numbers, z1 and z2, and I'm going to multiply them together. And in order to do it, I have to distribute things around so I make sure I keep track of my real and imaginary parts. Then I have to regroup them which is uh, the result that I get. And this is all fine and good if I'm just multiplying two numbers. If I'm multiplying a lot, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, if we do it in our complex notation, then z1 times z2 would be r1 e to the j theta 1 times r2 e to the j theta 2. So the r, r's would multiply. So the distance of the origin would just multiply. So I'd have a factor r1 times r2. And if I remember my properties of exponentials, when I, mul when I multiply them together, the angles add. So in this sort of what we call polar form, it's actually quite easy. The uh, radius multiplies, or the, what we call the magnitude of the complex number, multiplies, and the angles add. Uh, likewise, division also is quite easy in our complex notation. So if I wanted to do z1 divided by z2, uh, we could do the same thing where we could write out the real imaginary part and expand things around. But here when I divide the two complex numbers, the angles subtract, and these r's just divide, so I have r1 over r, r2. Uh, so this is just sort of a quick example of complex multiplication division to show that it's it perhaps made a little bit easier to manipulate things uh, when we use this r theta notation rather than the x plus uh, jy notation. And that'll become more apparent, more and more apparent as we move along.